Welcome back. We have class again. Class keeps going. Well, now it keeps going before I had a few travel issues. But that being said, little well, um, I wanted to pay, turn, turn your attention to something you probably heard, uh, saw the announcement. We have a new homework out. Um, this homework, pretty much after the lecture today and next time, you'll be able to do most of this homework. It's a confirmatory factor analysis of some data I uh, collected way back in grad school from actual gamblers on a casino boat, which is kind of fun. For those of you who know diagnostic models, these are the data that started the Dino model. Uh, so those, that, that's, that's fun too. Um, but we'll get into that as you go. The homework is due a week from Friday. There's an additional part to the homework, which is the course project introduction. Basically, what I'm looking for is, uh, I know we have this course project I haven't talked much about, but now they're finally in psychometric models. I wanted to sort of bring this up. We have um, a course project I'd like you to do. The goal of the course project is to take what you're, take, what you're learning from class, which are very canned examples, sometimes simulated data, actually not really simulated data, but you know something that I'm doing, and then transfer it to data that you know better. So basically the idea is this, the introduction for it will give me a very brief literature review, I'm talking like one or two pages, and um, a set of research questions and hypotheses and a description of your data. So I'm looking for you to do, at the bare minimum, a course project on, your, on a data set applying this. Um, now there's some flexibility though. Um, if, if you want to try simulating your own data, that's fine too. We can do that. Just uh, come talk to me about it in office hours or otherwise write about it in this course project uh, introduction. I also note that this is, uh, the maximum page limit is 10 pages. That does not mean you need to write 10 pages. I'm okay with fewer. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. How many other instructors tell you, yeah, less is more here. Really what I'm talking about is something that gives me a, a sense for your data. That's your literature review and your data description. And then something that tells me what you're going to do with the data, what type of analysis you want. Um, the, the basics of the analysis should be something that does deals with psychometrics, although I'm willing to be flexible with that as well too if you don't have the right data for it. I'm prioritizing your data to the psychometric, uh, more over the psychometric model itself. Uh, let's see here. If you do not have a data set and you'd like to use one, send me an email or come talk to me in office hours. Um, that will give you a chance to, well, I'll give you, I have lots of data, so I can find something for you or we can find something online as well too. Um, anybody have thoughts or questions or anything about this? Yeah. No, actually, that's the fun thing about this. Um, with Bayes, if you have a small sample size, we can probably make it work. Now, the results will look a lot like prior distributions, but I actually, uh, I would like you to have a sample size. It'd be better if it was more than, you know, five or six individuals. But other than that, I'm fine. I mean, like there's a lower bound of zero, clearly, uh, in which point our Bayesian algorithm will just return our prior distributions. Um, but no, I'm actually, that's one, one of the fun things about this. I'm going to be sample size agnostic. In fact, if you have small sample sizes, that might even be more fun. How's that sound? Uh, so when I say I was just making a number, uh, five observations in total, they may have, you know, multiple measurements per observation, but, um, yeah, small sample sizes are great. We can, we can make, in fact, again, not great. Don't expect to get a lot of information out of a small sample size, but from a goal of the, um, project standpoint, small sample sizes actually might make you interact more with the Bayesian algorithm to get it to work. So in some ways, from a learning experience, uh, uh, small sample sizes are great. Uh, and in general, people turn to Bayesian methods for small sample sizes. Did that answer what you were asking, Ryan? Okay. If I could just spend a minute on the small sample size comment, though, because this is a great point for discussion. 
Um, in small sample sizes, if you're using uh, maximum likelihood based methods, the optimizer may have a hard time finding a maximum, right? It may fail to converge. Um, mainly just because there's not a lot of information about that likelihood. Like it's a very flat surface. So finding a maximum of a flat surface is difficult. In a Bayesian sense, what we're trying to do is sample from a posterior, at least in Markov chains, uh, with Markov chains. And when we put a prior distribution on, that posterior takes the flat data likelihood and starts to give it a shape. Now, that prior distribution is subjective. So guess what's going to happen? That shape is going to be heavily informed by your prior. Not only that, like if you take my approach, my, my approach is more uninformative prior as much as possible. Uh, so you'll get the most uninformative prior possible to give you like convergence. What's going to happen is even though, uh, and, and, and I'm going to just be clear about this, like people think Bayesian is a fix for small sample sizes. And with respect to estimation, it is because you can adjust parameters of your model and receive estimates. But with respect to signal in your data, it is not, right? So making it clear to think, just because Bayes will get a model to run that may not have worked in maximum likelihood doesn't mean the results will be super informative. In fact, if we do our Bayesian methods right, we should have a bunch of noise, most likely from a small sample size. But then we can update that once we have a bigger sample size as we go forward. That's sort of the thought of Bayes. So you may hear people talking about small sample sizes from uh, saying Bayes, hey, that Bayes fixes the small sample size issue. I would say it may fix it with respect to convergence. So you'll get estimates of a model, but it may not fix it with respect to information out of the, like there's just no, at some point you don't have a lot of information and data when you have a small sample size. Bayes cannot create information from that. But Bayes may help, Bayesian methods may help you get numbers, at least, to go with it. That makes sense. But from a project perspective, like the process of getting convergence will, may take some iterations with small sample sizes, which to me, as an instructor, that's great. The more that you work with Bayes, the more you learn how to do it. Uh, that's great for me. That doesn't mean all of you, I want you all dropping your sample size down to five. Please don't do that. Um, but that does mean that it does fit well with the project. So Ryan, I'm sorry to belabor the point, but I wanted to take the, the chance to talk about Bayes and small sample size. When we say it fixes it, it means it gives you numbers. It doesn't mean the numbers have any meaning or value. Does that make sense? All right. Other questions on this? No questions. All right. How many of you have data? Let me just show a hand. You can raise your hand or give a thumbs up or something like that. Some. All right. Well, uh, I can't emphasize this enough. Come talk to me if you have questions. Come talk to me if you if need help. Uh, this first part of the project I will read and comment on, and it helps me to set up how to build your model to estimate it as well, too. So the goal with this is the project to me is almost like a guided individual study so that you have a data set, you're building a model, and I'm gonna help you estimate or implement Bayes with that model. Um, you may be able to do it yourself, that's great. I don't fully expect that for everybody or for anybody, right? Uh, it's a challenge, but my goal is to sort of work with you on it. So think of this as the entry into discussing with me how to make things work. And Vladimir, of course, I shouldn't just, just say me. Vladimir went through this process. Vladimir, in your project, you we met fairly frequently in office hours to talk about steps and so forth. And that's sort of the goal of it is to get our conversation working together, sort of trying to let me give you some guided individual study, uh, uh, learning on Bayes. Okay. One minor thing, clicking on the homework three link will download the homework two document. Oh, I didn't realize that link. Well, I will uh, fix that. Just a second. What the heck is happening here? Hang on. Now all my screen is going to heck. All right, there we go. Okay, are we, uh, any other questions? Anything to think, to, to, to talk about? To think, whatever. That. All right, should we get back to where we left off the last time? Let me ask a fun question. What do you remember 
with respect to where we left off the last time. Oops, I grabbed the wrong data set, the wrong uh, set of slides. These are the lecture slides that are listed under the October 17th and October 22nd right here, by the way. So I'll click this here. I remember the exciting conclusion, which is surprising because most days I don't remember my name. Uh, wait, where did it go? It looked like this right here where we had, we estimated the model and we found R hat being a problem for some of our parameters. Remember that? All right, let's take a look at this again, just to refresh your memory. Uh, the model itself was uh, a, a factor, a confirmatory factor analysis model or a factor analysis model. Uh, turns out with anything with a likelihood, by the way, a confirmatory factor analysis or exploratory factor analysis, they're all the same likelihood. So to a likelihood, in a likelihood perspective, there is no such thing as CFA versus EFA. You have to make, it, make a set of identifying constraints. Our constraints are just simply that there's one dimension. That dimension makes it easy so long as we have mean and uh, you know scale. Basically, we're setting the scale of theta to be standardized right here. So we have a standardized latent variable called theta. It multiplies for each item a uh, factor loading, or in other terms, slope or discrimination parameter. And every item has an item intercept as well. And then every item had a uh, unique variance, is what we normally call it. But because of stands parameterization, this is a unique standard deviation. Cool? This is basically what we did with linear models with a normal outcome, normal assumption of the outcome, but with a latent variable. right? So the, the difference is we just have 10 dependent variables, whereas we had one before, and we have one that we didn't observe. And so be, based on identification, based on base theory, we can actually go and basically impute what that data would be. And Vladimir, you started the class talking about missing data that I'm teaching next semester. By the way, theta is missing. Just a heads up. I'm going to try to incorporate that in my class too. Theta is missing. How do we handle missing data? All right. So build our data object. We start our cross-sampling process. There's 177 uh, people. That means there's 177 thetas. There's 10 observed variables, each with three parameters, uh, an intercept, factor loading, and residual standard deviation. Um, what I will say is for your practice, remember how it is difficult to anticipate how much warm-up and how much burn-in you need. You need. So I'm starting here with a warm-up of 1,000 and a burn-in of 2,000. And typically longer chains will be needed for more complicated models. This model actually doesn't turn out to be complicated, but then we get this result right here. And I can tell you this result right here will not be fixed by lengthening the chain. And this is one of the features that Bayesian psychometrics is a little bit different from observed variables with. And it's that process that we saw before. Um, so we know this model didn't converge and I'm going to tell you right now, the reason it didn't converge is this term right here, right? Each of the lambdas look like they're not converged. The mu's converged. Those are the same. The size converged, right? The lambda didn't. What's going on with lambda? Well, if you recall in my previous lecture when we gave the general psychometric theory, turns out this likelihood has two basically modes, peaks to it, right? The model data likelihood. One is where positive lambda times positive theta. But it's equally likely, or it's reflected about where we have a negative lambda times a negative theta. So basically think of it this way. If I, ref if I change theta to be neg negative 1 times all of thetas, and I changed all the lambdas to be negative 1 times all the lambdas, a negative times a negative results in the same value. So it's the same likelihood for positive theta, positive lambda, and negative theta, negative lambda. And that turns out to be the problem with what we're incorporating here. And I'm going to show that in a few slides in just a moment. But why, why this is a problem in psychometrics is purely because we don't observe theta. And so the algorithm, when it starts, it starts, it randomizes, uh, basically starts sampling between negative two and two. 
And depending on chance, depending on where the random values are, it moves toward the center of mass of the posterior distribution. Well, I have these, um, these two hands that I'm listening, look, show you, you can't see this on YouTube, but I have my two hands up. There's two distributions. Actually, you know what I could do? I could show this on YouTube. Hang on a second here. Uh, quick time. And I will draw this. This is an important concept. In fact, this is the biggest hurdle to getting, um, to getting Bayesian psychometrics running in Stan. All right, so our posterior distribution, let's say for a, a given value of lambda, we'll have two modes like this. Now, actually, this is lambda conditional on theta as well, too, because theta and lambda kind of move together with this. And if you were to look at the theta results, you'd see those were not converged, too. Well, in the middle here is where the starting value is, right? Here's zero. Let's say this is negative two. This is positive two, something along those lines, right? It, depending on chance, the algorithm may start you and move this way, or the algorithm move, might move the other way. But the problem is, because of the way that the stand is built, it sort of seeks like where the, the mass of the density of the posterior is, once you start moving to one direction, it won't, it won't leave. It'll kind of get sucked in and it'll stay in the mass and you'll sample around this mass for that parameter. Well, we have four different chains, each with a different starting value. And when you see a result like you have on the screen here, where did it go? Just a moment. right here, this really indicates that at least one of the chains showed up in this regime and one, of the, and one or more of the chains showed up somewhere else. So how you balance that is difficult. Any questions on this? Okay, so what do we do? Let me show you. Let me start right there and talk a little bit about modeling strategy versus my didactic strategy, didactic being teaching. Um, at this point, one should investigate the model fit of the model we just ran. And if the model doesn't fit, then all of the, if, because model fit in actually in factor analysis, CFA and structural equation modeling, we kind of go overboard on model fit, right? If you took SEM class with Lisa Hoffman or somewhere else, you'll probably be able to name a bunch of acronyms for model fit indices like RMSEA, CFI, TLI, you go down the list. Um, in the 1980s, it seemed like every every month in a different journal, there was a new fit index that was introduced in SEM, sort of a cottage industry of model fit. Um, there have been a few that survive that we tend to, and that's mainly, I feel like now is because M plus just spits, spits out a few. Levon sort of copies it, right? RMSEA, CFI, TLI. Long story short, we need model fit because if the model doesn't fit, then our model parameters could be biased. And by bias, we mean wrong. Right? They won't give us the right estimates. Misleading. Now, this happens to both item parameters and person parameters. And I will say, in this is the interesting thing about psychometrics. Psychometrics gets used broadly across social sciences. In educational measurement, we're mostly concerned about person parameters. But it turns out if our model isn't fit, we could have bias in the person parameters as well, too. Or their standard errors. Right? We don't really talk about that much, but it's, it is possible. But in not educational measurement in psychology and sociology and other different places in social science, we're often concerned about the structure of the model. Like what are we uncovering? Structure of mental states, structure of knowledge, structure of trends, all sorts of things. Often those involve item parameters and it turns out the item parameters will be biased also if the model doesn't fit or can be biased, I should say. Uh, moreover, the uncertainty accompanying each parameter, right, when what we categorize as the posterior standard deviation, standard deviation, may also be biased, right? So if you have a model that doesn't fit the data, not only will the center of the posterior distribution be different from where it should be, but the spread of the posterior distribution will be different as well. In my practice, in the times I've run this, it tends to look like when the model doesn't fit, we actually think we have much more knowledge about a parameter, so that posterior standard deviation is smaller for misfitting models. Isn't that kind of funny? That's it's very interesting, isn't it? That the thought that your model doesn't fit, and the result of that is you look like you have a smaller posterior standard deviation for some of your parameters. A smaller posterior standard deviation usually is cause for celebration. Hey, that's great. 
right? Because now we have more certainty for what we do. The problem is the certainty that we have in our model depends on how certain we are it fits the data. It's sort of like a bias. Actually, it's not sort of. A, it is a bias. It's a negative bias on the standard deviation, the posterior standard deviation. Right. Now, in psychometric models, that's particularly bad because it turns out a lot of our psychometric models are built to go and talk about how reliable an instrument might be. And that reliability actually comes from, in many places, our posterior standard, posterior standard deviation for theta, our latent variable. So it turns out if our model doesn't fit, then our posterior standard deviation for thetas might be shrunken artificially, which means our reliability goes up. So if you want to build a really, really reliable instrument, you have two options. Do your homework, work hard at it, measure it, keep trying, keep working, keep doing, you know, iterate, or build a really crappy instrument that doesn't fit, ignore the model fit indices, and show reliability. Sorry, that's a little bit cynical. But the point I'm trying to make is model fit is huge when it comes to reliability. In fact, um, if you look at in... in um, Educational measurement, we have this uh, book called The Standards for Psychological Testing, Edu not just educational measurement. It's a, um, it's a book that describes you know, how we go about doing our process. It's, it's built by American Psychological Association, authored by American Psychological Association, the American Educational Research Association, and the National Council on Measurement and Education. So the acronym SOUP there, APA, AERA, and CME. To me, the book is somewhat in, insufficient because what that describes a validity argument, to me, validity starts with model fit, all right? How uh, many places in the book that I've read, and maybe this is a mischaracterization because I'm just sort of summarizing in, in vocal, vocally here, so take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but the idea is a lot of times you see validity arguments start with a, per, a score, right? And what, what does it mean? How does it relate to other scores? What does the score predict the future, et cetera, et cetera. To me, validity starts with before the score. Now, there are validity arguments to talk about the alignment of items to constructs. That's important. That should be there. But there's a missing step in between alignment of items to constructs and score, and that's model fit. Your alignment of items to constructs is a hypothesis. Your model fit is like the hypothesis test. If it doesn't fit, then there's something wrong in the alignment. It may not just be the wrong uh, wrong constructs. There may be other constructs that are in, infiltrating, that are being measured, that you don't have as part of your model. That's the thought. How are we doing with this conversation? Okay, model fit's huge. I'm going to stop there, though, <laughs> because to teach in a generalized sense, we're first going to talk about models for observed, differing models for observed data, right? So I'm going to go and teach you all of these models, and then we're going to talk about model fit. Because in the Bayesian sense, model fit, you have to build yourself, right? You saw my stan output here. Now I just printed out the item parameters. Could have printed out the latent variables. Where's my model fit statistic? Anybody want to guess? There isn't one, <laughs> right? When you push a button on Levon or the Bayesian version of Levon, Blavon, some model fit comes out. Here, no, there is none. Guess what you have to do? You have to build model fit into your analysis itself. And the way I'm teaching this class, I'm trying to build incrementally one concept at a time. I'm going to teach concepts of how we build, parameterize the model first, because I feel like that's the first challenge, getting it to run and run successfully. And then once I get done talking about CFA or IRT or so forth, then I'm going to talk about model fit, model fit methods. Because it turns out Bayesian model fit methods tend to be the same across even each of the, each of the distributions that we see. And you've heard about some of model fit before, right? You heard about PPMC and you've heard about um, WAIC or leave one out with uh, Pareto Smooth Important Sampling, L-O-O-P-S-I-S, which is, I don't even know how you say that. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to talk about model fit yet. So remember that, okay? Okay. So we don't know if this fits, but let's move on. Let's take a look at these item parameters real quick here. Um, we can investigate item parameters 
through a plot that's described as an IRT more frequently, something called an item characteristic curve. Well, it turns out we can build an item characteristic curve in any type of psychometric model. Factor analysis, IRT, uh, we can do it with polytomous or binary items in IRT, and then models that don't even have a name. Like if you have a count model, like Poisson distribution or negative binomial, we can build an I I item characteristic curve for that as well too. It's a nice way of plotting data, and it actually is the it's actually the first step to where we get to PPMC coming up as well too. Right? We don't call it this in CFA, but it's equivalent, and it's there's a general form for it. So basically, the item characteristic curve is a plot of the expected value of the response conditional on the value of the latent trait. Right? So for us, the latent trait theta, the expected value for any item is given by that linear predictor mu sub i plus lambda times theta in the CFA model. When we get to IRT, as we saw in the sort of the general lecture, this thing may become an inverse logit. So e to this over one plus e to this for binary data. But that also is something we can draw. So this is where it's going to help us see where the, the model um, lack of convergence shows up. So this is our item characteristic curve for the factor analysis. And let me describe what you're seeing here, All right? So each item that we used was a Likert scale item scored one through five, right? This is the conspiracy theory data that we had before. So the blue dashed line represents the limit of the range of our items, okay? The red line, red dashed line is the EAP estimate of our model parameter, of our, of our ICC. So what, what do I mean by EAP? That means if we go take our posterior mean for mu and our posterior mean for lambda, we can vary values of theta. And what we see is this line right here, All right? So the black lines are the posterior draws. And this is where the bimodality shows up. When you see this X looking thing right here, what we have is a reflection right about this way, zero, and this way, right? So what that's indicating to me is that for some posterior draws, for one of the chains, I'm going to say one of the chains, and you're going to see why in just a bit, we had samples that went where we had negative lambda times negative theta, and that's what you see here. And for three of the chains, we had the opposite direction. And actually, and I say that, so why, let me ask you a question in, in observing this plot. Why did I say there's one chain that had negative and three chains that had positive? What would indicate that? Curious question for you. This is not an easy question. Yes, that's it. The EAP is the average, and because it is not flat, that would indicate there's at least one more chain on the positive side than the negative side. If we had two and two, we would expect the EAP to be flat and it would be equal to our item intercept, basically, right? So good answer. Thank you, Ryan. Other questions, any questions about this? So what do we do? Anybody want to take a guess as to what to do? Quit using bays. That's what my wife would say. Lisa Hoffman, I should say. Quit using bays. Why are you using bays in the first place? Because bays is magic. All right. Uh, answer from Lingual. Uh, pick another seed and try again. That is one thing we could do. Yes. Yes. Um, however, the chance of this happening is almost equally likely again as well, too, which is quite frustrating. So let me walk you through Actually, let me just give you, there's multiple steps to this. And actually, it's, it's more complicated than it seems on the surface. Um, moreover, this type of thing tends to happen with Stan way more than with any other Bayesian piece of software. And the reason for that is Stan uses, again, the shape of the posterior. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo with no U-turn sampling and sort of moves you to a posterior mode. That's going to be the problem. And the problem starts with sort of where we initialize theta right here. So the fix that I'm going to tell you about now and then show you analytically in just a moment 
there's multiple, but the fix I would recommend is basically taking your starting values and restricting them to be positive. Because if we can get the chain to move toward the positive mode, then we can get a result we want. That is what I'm gonna teach you today. There are other methods that I might bring back later in class because this, this thing shows up in all the complicated models as well. Uh, one of the other simple methods of constraining this is basically saying, I'm gonna take my slopes and constrain them to be positive. That is what's in the textbook I assigned. Uh, one of the ways that you could do that is by using a prior distribution, like, like a log normal distribution or something that's strictly positive. But there's problems with that in that there are, quickly when you get out of simple measurement models, right, unidimensional, uh, particularly when you move away from within item unidimensionality, right, where there's, when, when you end up having more than one latent variable measured by an item, like on the item response function, it's possible these things might be negative for certain reasons. Right? And that's important. We want to keep them. We want to allow them to be negative. We want to just say, yeah, force them all to be positive. Now, technically, if one of them was negative, you would expect its posterior density to be shoved up against zero. Right? Uh, so you could uh, look at it that way, but that's, that's sort of distasteful to me. So anyway, let me go through with what we have here. Let's talk about um, the posterior distributions of these item parameters real quick here. Um, so before... Let's look at this real quick. The posterior distribution of the item parameters is written this way, right? The distribution of mu, lambda, and psi, psi being unique standard deviation, conditional on y in a Bayesian sense is proportional to the data conditional on the parameters, that's our model data likelihood, times the prior likelihood. And in this case, I'm writing it as f of mu, lambda, and psi. When you see multiple parameters within the parentheses, that refers to a joint distribution. So if you're not familiar with statistics, a joint distribution is like a multivariate normal. You have these two parameters. There's a multivariate density that goes with it itself. Um, the, dis the distribution of the parameters conditional in the data is what I just mentioned. This is where our normal distribution comes from. But the joint distribution for the, prior dis for the priors actually is re-expressed a little bit differently. If you look at our prior parameterization, which is right here, because I'm specifying lambda on a different line than mu and mu and lambda on a different line than psi, I'm specifying prior distributions that are independent for these three. And by independent, we mean no correlation, nothing else. And the reason for that is simple, right? I can make a guess, a pretty good guess as to what lambda should be based on the model I'm using. We talked about this the last time. I'm expecting lambda with a standardized factor to be somewhere between zero and one mostly, maybe maybe a little bit bigger than one depending on the scaling of the item. Right. I can talk about where I expect mu to be, right? It should be between one and five. But I cannot tell you, for instance, how mu and lambda are correlated. That would be, that's what, what it takes, right? And remember, a prior distribution is about belief. Do any of you have a belief that the item intercept and the factor loading should be correlated? Anybody? That gets into the part of statistics where our eyes glaze over, right? Which is, how do parameters correlate? And what does a correlation among parameters mean? Um, in some bits of item response theory, people will talk about how difficulty of an item and discrimination of an item may be related, and we'll see that when we get to the dichotomous lecture in just a mo moment. But generally speaking, I don't have a belief as to what this needs to be, so therefore, I am just going to leave it to be uncorrelated. Independent and uncorrelated mean the same thing in this case. So what that really means is the joint distribution gets respecified as a product. So whenever you have variables that are independent of each other, you can specify their joint distribution as simply being a product of their marginal distributions, right? And that's what we end up having here. So this overall posterior likelihood is proportional to the model data likelihood times each of the likelihoods for each of the prior distributions as well. Okay. Excellent. Questions about any of this? 
No questions. Moving on. Let's take a look at the latent variables. This is an interesting concept as well, because what, what you see here is some variables that converged. And then some that are 1.53. Where did you see that 1.53 before for the R hat? That was the same value that we saw with lambda, right? The R hat for lambda and the R hat for theta. And this is another clue that this bimodality of the posterior is in effect here. But we can take a look at each of these latent variables as well. And here are our EAP estimates. Now, again, this is not the right result. Okay, so there we have it. There's our EAP estimates. This is the density of our EAP. This is our factor score distribution. Now remember, this is not exactly accurate because again, if you have a theta right here, it's 1.53, it's EAP and we had sort of derived this before, there's one chain where theta was negative, and then three chains where theta was positive, and we get an EAP of 0.768. That's not exactly the right where, where it needs to be. This right here is a density of all draws, all posterior draws. So let's, let's compare this real quick. And actually, let me talk about this just one more time, right? When we specify our model, we specified theta followed a standard normal distribution. But when we output our EAP estimates, we get this distribution right here. It's a histogram, this is a smooth histogram. Why are they different? Would we expect theta to be a normally distributed with a mean of zero and standard deviation one? It's a weird concept, but think of it this way. Theta, when we specify it with a mean of zero standard deviation one, that's a prior distribution, right? What we're looking at here is the posterior mean aggregated across each person. So it's like we've updated our prior for theta to look like something like this right here. So it's not exactly the same. Moreover, if we were to go and look at all the draws, right? So instead of looking at just the mean of each person and putting it in a histogram, right? We have 177 observations, 177 posterior means. If I didn't do that, right? Remember we had four chains, each with a thousand samples, draws, right? So we had a total of 4,000 draws per person. If I disaggregated which person those draws came from and I made a big data matrix, of 4,000 times 177, which I, I'm not even gonna do the math on that, I get this histogram. And that thing, with the exception of this big, you know, like someone pointing a finger up right here, um, that thing looks a little more symmetric, right? Well, I can tell you this, this thing with the, the big pile right here is part and due to our bimodality of our space, right? Remember, there's one that's negative and one that's positive. This thing looks a little bit more normal. I will note there's questions on the homework for both of these plots, by the way, too. So you can trace down and through my syntax that I've given you and figure out how to plot these as well. Furthermore, <laughs> we're going to compare two posterior distributions. Remember, person one's theta was really close to zero. So it looked like it converged. But my guess is it's, it's also going to have an effect of having bimodality on it. Person two's theta had the 1.53 R hat, and this is what you can see. We have a pile of thetas that are at the top, uh, high, right? Where the center is somewhere like one and a half. And we have a pile of thetas that are low, reflected about zero, where the center is right about negative one and a half. So what we would want to say with this person is this negative pile right here really should be on the positive side. This is where we had the flip of the, the theta and so forth. So this density should be much higher. And we would expect this person's theta to actually be something like one and a half or close to one and a half. How are we doing so far? We can also calculate the EAP estimate with the, uh, and compare that to the posterior standard deviation. This thing right here 
shouldn't be curved. Let's put it this way. So what am I doing here with this plot? Well, this is again, each person's posterior mean of their theta. And then this on the y-axis is each person's posterior standard deviation, right? In item response theory, these two, this type of curve would be fairly normal, meaning there are parts of the theta scale that we measure more accurately than others. Uh, and by more accurate, it means a smaller posterior standard deviation. But this plot's influenced by the bimodality as well. Go figure. Right? In a factor analysis, what we should see is that the posterior, the, the, the standard error of theta and the point estimate of theta are uncorrelated. Right? If we were to make an item information plot for theta for factor analysis, it'd be flat. In item response theory, we have a curved item information. So the reason why it's flat in factor analysis is the assumption of normal, of the normal distribution of our data, right? The normal distribution of our data in a normal distribution, this is statistics trivia for you here. Impress your friends at trivia night, okay? In a normal distribution, you can derive and show analytically with proof that the mean, or in the case of multivariate normal, mean vector and the covariance matrix are independent. Put another way, the mean and the, and the variance are independent. And when you assume a normal distribution for your outcomes, turns out that passes on that independence to the latent variable as well too. Because the mean distribution for the, the, the latent variable distribution itself, you can sort of show derives, it becomes normal. Similarly, uh, so anyway, long story short, factor analysis, we shouldn't see this. We should see a flat line. This is a little bit weird. Going to the next slide, we could also plot each person's total score, right? The sum of all their items. So they have 10 items. Uh, they range from 1 to 5. So the, this total score goes from 10 to 50. We can plot that with each person's estimate of theta. This is, again, going to be influenced by the bimodality that you saw before, too. Any questions on any of this so far? Let me back up one second. In a factor analysis, would you expect a perfect linear relationship between a person's total score and a point estimate of their latent variable? This is more on the psychometric side. No. Um, they're not perfectly related. In fact, you can see for a given sum score, we may have a, a bunch of different thetas, right? Now they're highly related though, like super highly related. If anybody want to guess as what this correlation between sum score and theta happens to be? That's like 0 0.99, 0 0.98, maybe 0 0.95, something like that. High correlation. It turns out there's one factor analysis model where you get a perfect correlation. That's called the parallel items model. The parallel items model is a model where we basically allow each item to have the same, where did it go? Each item will have the same loading and unique standard deviation. So we'd take the item off. There'll only be one loading, one standard deviation. And in that case, you get a perfect correlation between factor score and sum score. It's one. You can, again, show that as well, too. So interesting stuff here. That's why the sum score persists in factor analysis. People will do a factor analysis and then not output the latent variable and just take the sum score, and that's because people would say, well, it's roughly the same anyway, I think. It's not the same like this in factor in IRT, though. The, the, when you use a link function, the tails get kind of different, nonlinear. Okay, how are we doing so far? Any questions on any of this? Yeah. Everybody's a pro, it seems like. Either that or it's the online course. I haven't quite figured it out. All right, let's keep going. Posterior per distribution for person parameters. All right, let's talk about what the person parameter distribution is. This is the distribution of theta conditional on our data. And remember, this is for each person. Technically, this should be y sub p. I'm sorry, I didn't put that in there. 
I will make a note to change that too. But, so that is the distribution of theta given our data is proportional to the distribution of the data given theta times the prior distribution of theta, right? This is our model data likelihood here, and this is our prior. Well, our model data likelihood, oh, and there's another technical issue here, f of, of theta given y is our posterior distribution of a latent variable. That is this thing, actually this thing right here. What should be in these dollar signs, and for those of you who have never written LaTeX before, that's a LaTeX symbol to make a LaTeX math uh, code. What should be here is the model data likelihood, which is this term right there. And I'll get that fixed uh, when, I, when I update the, the course. Um, this model data likelihood for a given person is simply the product of each item's density conditional on theta across all items, right? And it's this product because we assume a psychometric property called local independence or conditional independence, meaning once we condition on a person's latent variable, our items are independent. So that's where this local independence shows up, right? This y right here, there should be an equal sign down here, but this, this part right here is our model data likelihood, right? A normal distribution evaluated at a person's theta with that item's parameters used in the, in the normal distribution, right? So how do we calculate that? We go back to the normal PDF, right? One over the square root of two pi sigma squared times e to the, you know, x minus mu squared over negative two sigma squared. That thing, remember that? Plug in each of those values. And when I said sigma, I really should have said psi. That should show up there. Uh, and we get a height, height of the curve. So that's really what's happening here. And then f of theta, given uh, it, it follows a normal distribution. Uh, this is the prior likelihood, right? So that's how we calculate it. And if you want some technical details, you can take a look at it here, a previous lecture. If you'd like to go derive that direct that lecture right there actually says in this case by the way right we can show that the posterior density of our latent variables given y follows a normal distribution we can actually derive it and that's what those slides do right there so if you're interested mathematically as to why i can say that you can follow the steps to trace out why mentally is the following right in a multivariate normal distribution where each of the uh, marginal distributions are independent, right? You can express it as this product right here. So basically you could say, hey, this is multivariate normal. And then that's independent of this thing, which is also multivariate normal. And if all of this is multivariate normal and they're independent, we can put them in a giant multivariate normal distribution. And what results is this last posterior density is taking a conditioning set of that multivariate normal distribution and there's some really well-defined um, mathematics that show what that should be so in this lecture way back way back when this was a uh, 2015 long ago right some of you might have been in high school back then um, that thing I basically derived what the distribution of theta should be because at the time I was teaching CFA using Levon in the early days of Levon. And if I remember correctly, we couldn't get the standard error for each factor score. So I had to go and build what that should be. And the mathematics are in that right there. So what I'm telling you is this. In many cases in Bayes, in many cases in psychometrics, we cannot definitively say that our latent variables follow normal distribution. And that's because the model data likelihood doesn't have a normal distribution in it. Right. What we can say is that as the, as the number of observation goes to infinity, because this is a parameter with a likelihood function, we could say that parameter will converge to a normal distribution. But in the case of factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, we can definitively say that the posterior distribution of our latent variable is normal. And that will hold for one item. Sorry, not we can't estimate a one item well. Three items. <laughs> or, or an infinity of items. Okay? You ever heard that before? Mathematically? I don't know. 
So my interests gravitate toward the technical side of this stuff. I'm like, oh, that's cool. In factor analysis, again, stat trivia, the posterior distribution theta is normal, regardless. In IRT, it becomes normal based on asymptotics, but it may not be normal when you have small numbers of items. Okay? Cool. All right, measurement model estimation fails. This is what I was talking about before. <laughs> The parameterization of lambda can lead to problems in estimation, right? The issue is this term right here. And Linguo, I think you mentioned uh, different number seed. Yes, I did do that. Thanks for looking at the slides ahead of time. If I use the number seed 0910-2022, which is actually when I built these slides first, October 9th, 2022, everything worked just fine. But if I use change the seed to... 10, uh, 20, uh, 25 10 2022 or October 25th 2022 you get big problems right so this is the October 10th version those are those numbers and those are the values these are the densities for everything as well so you saw all this before and actually I should have built this lecture with it the opposite way and actually you give me a moment I really want to go and change this so let me go log into our IDAS I know this is going to take I should have have this available ahead of time. I actually had it up ready for us and then my, I had to restart my computer. So apologies for my own snafu when it comes to this, but I want to go and, and show this in a way that makes sense real quick. Build, build, build. This makes for great YouTube, doesn't it? Like when you watch this again, when you see me stumbling over everything, like, yeah, relive this. Okay, let's go to the R file and let's change this here. Okay. So I'm going to compile a stand program and we're going to play around with the random number seed real quick here. And here it runs with the 9, 10, 20, 22 version. But I'm going to guess this is giving me, yeah. <laughs> you see this number right here? <laughs> I'm laughing. So I mentioned before my seed, 9, 10, 20, 22, worked fine, but it doesn't. You know why? When I built these slides, I ran them on my local machine. Turns out, Random number processes may vary by local versus server. Pull the hair out a little bit. That's why I'm bald and gray, in addition to being old. So one of the problems I have is trying to show you making this work. Get this. So uh, I mentioned this to one of my students in a meeting yesterday, talking about when you're at the end of grad school, you sort of stop taking classes, and that's a weird feeling because you feel like your class is where you learn some stuff. True. Um, as a faculty, we sort of teach there. We, I like to sort of pick a class to teach to learn something. And in fall of 2022, that was my turn to learn Stan. And I'm building these lectures and I'm finding this result. Like, oh my goodness, what's going on? I can't believe this because JAGS doesn't work like this. It worked much better in JAGS. Let me just change the seat around and see if we can get it to cooperate a little bit better here. Uh, I'm guessing we actually won't No. All right, one more time for the seed. Make this today's, or not today's date. Yeah, look at, and the other thing you can sort of see when it runs, you have a little bit of discrepancy in, you have chains one, three, and four finish in a little bit faster than chain two. Chain two is acting a little bit differently here. All right. Not going to be able to get this to work on the fly here. So let's go back to the lecture and I will repair it and talk about it a little bit later or the next time as well, too. But again, this is sort of the problem that we're talking about. Um, what I had intended to do with lecture is show you everything straight and I should have built that in first. I will fix it and we will make it straight the next time as well. But here, your posterior trace plots of theta, this thing 
uh, is person one's theta. Remember, person one looked like they had converged right here. But I will tell you, that just means that the modes for the person are really close together. Right? We know all the, the lambdas aren't going to be right. And then this is person two's theta. <laughs> there you can see it. We have chain, in this case, chain four up here. And then chains one, two, and three down below here. Which one do you like better? Hmm, I don't know. You can sort of back engineer it, right? We know that there should be somewhat of a positive relationship between theta and our scale. So if we went back and looked at, you know, whether this person had more than, uh, had, you know, their sum score was higher than average or lower than average, we probably could, re we could fix it, but it's a mess. Again, there's your posterior densities you saw before. So let's fix this a bit, right? We could constrain lambda to be positive right here by putting this lower equals zero. It's not ideal, right? Uh, and actually, when I specify a normal prior on lambda, which is what's in the model, and I put a lower bound of zero, what ends up, what Stan ends up doing is making this a truncated multivariate normal, which basically takes, right, remember our multivariate, our normal distribution, uh, when I said a zero mean, it's sort of 50% of the mass is on one side and 50% is on the other. In a truncated distribution, basically you take the mass of one side and flip it over and make the other side have the mass be taller, right? So the likelihoods are like double that they should be in a truncated sense. But when we do that, uh, the other thing we can do is set starting values, right? We can randomly start all lambda parameters so that they converge, basically make them really big. And here's how, all right? If I add this init function right here, so remember in, in Stan, we build a Stan object, in this case, model CFA Stan. And in the sample function that we run to go and do our MCMC process, there's an option called init. Init lets you specialize, uh, specialize, specify the starting values or the starting value distributions for sets of parameters. And it's a little bit clunky syntax, but basically this is the idea. We submit a function and that function returns the right number of started values. So basically for each chain, what Stan will do is call this R function from R and initialize the values using it rather than using its own built-in initialization method. So if I go back to, let me see where I've done this, the bottom of my code here, we can see this um, right, this is no warm up, do it right here. So now once I restrict those to be, or to the lambda, basically what am I doing? I'm starting lambda with a, a normal distribution where the mean is 10, the standard deviation is two. Now let's talk a little bit about MCMC theory. Remember, the magic of MCMC is regardless of where you start your parameters in the Markov chain. If you run the chain long enough, they'll converge to a posterior mode. It may not be the right mode though, right? So what we're doing is basically changing where the parameters are starting to look positive, right? My problem is those lambdas are going to negative. If I start them very positive, basically I am starting all of my lambdas way up here, uh, way up here in this region over here. The thought being that now, if I start them on this other side of, of my positive mode, they will center themselves in the positive mode and won't, they will not be able to escape sort of the gravity of this mode because when the density gets zero, they move back toward the center, right? Sort of using physics terms, but it's, it's sort of like the posterior mode in the Stan algorithm is almost like has its own like gravitational pull. It pulls in parameters in and doesn't let them go usually. They're, some cases where it does, but that's, let's not talk about that. So now let's take a look at our values and see if it worked. And this will be the time, by the way, I'm doing this example on the fly. Hey, look, that's what we want to see, right? There we go. So now if I print these values, you can see my R hat is one for everything the way we wanted it to be. 
and our thetas as well all have r hats of 1 as well too. So we achieve really good model convergence. And then this plot right here takes a bit of time to run. <laughs> this is with starting values versus without. You can sort of see we have this cross convergence of values here. Um, these are all the parameters. On the left-hand side, these are all the mean psi, lambda, and so forth. Uh, this is the other mean psi, lambda, and so forth. Anyway, I was trying to show the difference between the two there for it. And the, here's your results here. But then you can see even this plot changed too. Okay, what I really want to do though is show you what the plot should, should have looked like had I gotten this right to begin with and had my random number seed not blown up on Stan. So if I go here and I put this initialization prompt in our first model, that would make a big difference. So let's do that. Now the first model runs. And why I'm doing this is I want to re, re show those plots the way they should have looked before. We have convergence, which is good. Here are our item parameter results. You can see they're all converged. That's what we just showed before. But let me just do the following. Let's investigate the item parameters. Some, this is the item characteristic curve that we talked about with all the samples. Remember that item characteristic curve that made the X before? This is the plot the way it should have looked from the beginning. Oops, there's the lines and our EAP line as well, right here. So this is what it should have looked like, right? So the red line is your EAP estimate. The black lines are each the posterior draws of mu and lambda, right? So for all 4,000 samples. And then theta is just the numeric value on the x-axis. So this is a plot that Lisa shows often in her factor analysis section of the SEM class. It's an item characteristic curve plot. And this is what we usually ask the following question with. What's wrong with this plot? Does this look like valid data to use a CFA model for? And the answer usually is, well, no, because for thetas that are less than one standard deviation away from the mean, we get predicted values of scores that can't possibly happen. All right, so from the psychometric part of this, I wanted to show this plot to tell you this is why we move away from CFA for Likert type items, right? In fact, if we could do it differently, we'd use item response theory or some categorical distribution for those items with a link function, because these predictions are sort of, I don't know, what, what would you do with that, right? Just think about it. Yeah, you're predicted to rate that item even lower. You're strong, you, not only do you strongly disagree, you, ex, you extra strongly disagree or something like that, right? So anyway, let's take a look a little bit about the parameters themselves. This should have been the density, the posterior density for one of our item parameters. This is the 10th items loading, and you can see its range. Uh, the point estimate was somewhere around 0.7 or so. But if you were to build a, comp a credible interval for this, and actually let's take a look at that 10th item. 0.61 was its, um, was its posterior mean. The 90% credible, credible interval for it, which is actually in this case, 0.545 to 0.802. Now this is not the highest density posterior interval, the HDPI, but it's close, it's a symmetric distribution. So that's a big range. Of values right and that is reflective of us having a sample size of 177 going back to the sample size discussion for the beginning of class as our sample size grows we would expect this posterior distributions width to shrink for the item parameter as each, as we get more people taking our items we have more information about each item and that's how that that builds This, by the way, is a correlation plot. If we were to look at the distribution of, let me see what I have here. 
item parameters. Just a moment here. Our item parameters have mu and lambda. So this is when I was talking about what's the correlation between an item intercept and a factor loading. This is the posterior correlation between them right here. And numerically, actually, here's the numeric posterior correlation. It's super close to zero. That's good, right? We feel good about that? <laughs> it won't be in all the... It, as soon as we get to categorical data, this starts to get a little bit different. We'll, we'll show it next time. But this is um, another feature of what we have. Then, again, I can go through my previous slides, images, and I'll, I'll get those fixed. But this right here is an investigation of our latent variables. So here you have all of our thetas. The R hats are all zero again. And if I were to build the proper EAP distribution, the density of all of our EAP estimates, it looks like this. This is the right one, right? Because we got the bimodality out of the way. And what this tells us is the following. If this theta represents somebody's tendency to believe in conspiracy theories, most of our density doesn't, right? This looks like what we would call a floor, right? And it turns out it is a floor. So let's talk psychometric theory a little bit more, right? Your EAP estimates of theta, even though theta we say follows a normal distribution in prior, right? And we can say the posterior is normal as well. There's a constraint based on the number of obs observations of items that we have per person, right? And this pile of people right here, I'm going to get a uh, hypothesize that those are people who rated the lowest number on each item in the whole survey. And it represents um, a good chunk, a sizable 40% of our distribution maybe, right? We may have 80 people here, we have 177 total. So somewhere 40 to 50% of our sample rated each item as strongly disagree, right? They all get the same thetas in this case. Even though there's a normal distribution, even though there's a sampling process going on for, for what our data are doing, Right? If we run that chain long enough, the mean converges to be about the same. So that's the floor effect. It turns out that happens. Right, There will be a floor. Right? If we want less of a floor, we have to have lots more items. Well, where there's a floor, there's also a ceiling. And there's a couple people up here that are rating each item as strongly agree. I'm, I have to think that those are folks. I'd like to hope that those are people who are like, yeah, these are ridiculous. I'm just going to rate fives just for the fun of it. These are sort of the... Well, like what, what I was when I was an undergraduate or, or as a faculty member. No, I'm just kidding. I'd like to think I'm a little more pro-social than that. But that being said, we have a ceiling effect as well, too. And I'm get, gathering this little small blip right here. My hypothesis is those are people who rated each item as the top. So that is what we end up seeing. But pronounced, there is not a normal distribution when it comes to the factor scores. And that's because this is after we've updated our prior belief of standard normal, to look like something like this. Now, get this, here's the fun part of it. If you calculate the mean of this, it's gonna be darn close to zero because you have a pile over here and you have a, a skewed distribution over there. All right, so it'll be close to what you want it to be. And actually the standard deviation will be close to one, it'll actually be shrunken from one. So in many ways, the mean may be zero and the standard deviation may be one, but it's not at all normal, right? That is not a normal distribution. All right, the other part I wanted to show was the density. This is the smooth density as well too. This does not look normal. That's what we would expect. But if I then calculated the density of all the posterior draws, right? So this is all of the thetas that we may have put into a vector. This is a very long vector. It's 4,000 draws per person put into one big long vector of data, right? So it's got 1,415,000. Uh, this is the density of it. And yeah, actually we do have a big pile right there as well too. It happens. And then we can look at two theta distributions side by side as well. Now this is, looks more proper. This is the plot where I said person two, both of these had bimodality, but the, here's what you end up seeing. There's a different location for each, different mean for each, but the widths are about the same. And that's because of the tendency of the, the, the phenomenon of factor analysis to not have a different conditional standard error of measurement. Similarly, we can make that plot of mean theta versus standard deviation theta, posterior mean versus posterior standard deviation. 
This does have a bit of a trend, but take a look at the numbers. 0.24 to 0.29 is the range of the y-axis. The reason why there's a trend here, missing data. Missing data? No, not missing data. Short chain, short chain. There's no missing data in this. I did not tell you how to do missing data yet. Short chain. And similarly, we can compare EAP estimates with some scores, just like that. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to note with this, we have three minutes left, is we could compare theta. What happens with theta if we um, if we didn't estimate our item parameters? So this is a weird a weird phenomenon I wanted to talk about, but it's a part of Bayes that shows up. And actually, it's an interesting concept that just showed up in the conference I was at, at so in Seoul, actually. It's this. In psychometrics, what we often do if we give a person a test score is we calibrate a model, right? Meaning we get point estimates for our item parameters. And then we fix those point estimates to a value. Usually, in maximum likelihood, it would be the most likely ones. And Bayes would be the posterior mean, right? And then with those fixed values, we estimate thetas. Well, if we did that, what ends up happening is the following. I'm, just, I'm doing a long chain for each of these. Because what will end up happening is if we have uncertainty in our item parameter estimates, that should lead to more uncertainty in our theta parameters. And in Bayes, that really happens. You can think about it. At every step of our Markov chain, if, if our intercept and our loading are changing, right? Theta is going to have a hard time, have a wide window probably as well too. Whereas if intercept and loading are fixed, like that's one source of variability that won't change. So theta will converge to a different spot. And let me see if I can um, plot this real quick here. I'm going to run out of time, aren't I? Let's see. We can make it. Come on, Jonathan, you can do this. Give myself a pep talk but it's probably not going to work so basically i want to show you this what you would expect is what you will see is that the mean of theta will be about the same but the standard deviation of theta the posterior standard deviation will be smaller when you fix the item parameters which is something we rarely if ever talk about in item response theory or latent variable models right Item parameter uncertainty actually makes it harder for you to figure out person parameter. There should be more uncertainty to it. And we often just disregard that and throw it away. And in certain contexts, in the, the conference I went to in Seoul was the International Association for Computerized Adaptive Testing, CAT, Computerized Adaptive Assessments. If we disregard the item parameter uncertainty, we really potentially bias the standard deviation, conditional standard error of measurement of theta. And that's a topic that um, there was a, a couple papers last decade that talked about that, but hasn't really gotten a lot of traction in what we do. But remember that as we go. In Bayes, we can sort of see it a little bit better. But for today, we're out of time. Um, so I'm going to stop here. If you have any thoughts or questions in the lecture, please send them to me over email. I'll pick up here and we'll get to lecture 4C when we're done. I'll also make the plots better. I apologize for the bimodality issue. You got a live experience of bimodality and the problems that we have with Stan. Uh, so anyway, have a great rest of your day, uh, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you.